Hi, welcome back to UWorld's Next Gen NCLEX review. My name is Samantha and I am a nurse here at UWorld. I'm so excited to have you all here today for our pharmacology question drill. So we are covering pharmacology today. We get a lot of requests for medication and pharmacology based questions. So I hope we're meeting that need today. Uh, we're gonna go through questions today. So drop your answers in the chat. We have moderators standing by. Uh, make sure you let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you think the answers are and drop any comments or questions that you have in there as well. Um, after we are done here today, you can always find these lives on our Facebook or our YouTube page. So if you want to drop in, use them as a reference in the future, you are so welcome to do that. Um, just follow us at UWorld Nursing in order to find them on any of our social channels. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Question number one. Alrighty, so the nurse is preparing to administer Alteplase to a client who is um, experiencing an ischemic stroke. So which of the following findings would require follow-up prior to administering the medication? All right, option one, symptoms started two hours ago. Option two, left total hip replacement one year ago. Three, a blood pressure of 190 over 10. And lastly, four is right-sided muscle weakness. Alrighty, drop your answers in the chat. Let us know what you guys are thinking. So we have an ischemic stroke here. We're dealing with some neurological things. Uh, it also brings into play circulation, what's going on with this blood pressure. Um, so go ahead and drop those answers in the chat. Let us know what you're thinking. And if you haven't already, make sure to share this live. Um, if you have other nurses or nursing students in your social communities, they could also benefit from this. So go ahead and share away. And if you haven't followed us already, follow us at UWorld Nursing. We are so, so close to to 50,000 followers on a couple of our channels. So make sure uh, you follow and just help get us there. We're so, so close. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and jump to our correct answer. And that is going to be option three, that blood pressure that's so, so high. So Alteplase is a tissue plasminogen activator. You've probably heard this called TPA. Um, so it's a thrombolytic medication that activates that plasminogen to help to break up those thrombi or those blood clots um, and restore the perfusion to the client. So um, this is gonna be uh, something that is excellent at dissolving clots, um, but it doesn't do it discriminately. It's indiscriminate, it breaks up clots everywhere, which is going to put the client at risk for hemorrhage or increased bleeding. So there are a couple of contraindications that as nurses, we need to know that this is when we would hold the alteplase or the TPA. And those are going to be a hemorrhagic stroke, um, active bleeding, excluding menstruation, coagulation disorders, a recent head trauma, um, any kind of previous intracranial hemorrhage, as well as a recent surgery. And we would define recent as within the last 14 days or two weeks, as well as uncontrolled hypertension, um, which we would define as greater than or equal to 185 over 110. These are all contraindications for um, giving this medication and we would need to follow up and report them to a provider um, prior to administering because we do not want to administer it. Um, so in this case, this blood pressure option three, 190 over 110. That's above the parameters. This is very, very severely high blood pressure. We would want to hold this medication because if we give it with a blood pressure like this, it can cause an intra cerebral hemorrhage, excuse me. Um, options one, two, and four. So in option one, uh, symptoms started two hours ago. You have a four and a half hour window to give TPA. So this is still within that window. We're good to go. Option two, a total hip replacement one year ago. Our range, remember, for recent surgeries was we would hold it if a surgery was within the last 14 days. One year is far past that window. We are good to go here. And last si uh, lastly, right-sided muscle weakness. This is uh, one of the signs and symptoms we can see from a stroke. So this is most likely an indication to give this medication, not a reason to hold it. So again, option three was our correct option. Way to go. The nurse is caring for a client with diabetes mellitus who is receiving insulin Lispro and insulin Glargine. Which of the following statements by the nurse would require follow-up? So insulin Glargine reduces your risk of developing diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. Option two, I will wait to administer your insulin Lispro until your meal tray arrives. Option three, insulin Lispro dosing depends on the number of carbohydrates you will consume. And lastly, option four, I will check your capillary blood glucose one hour after insulin glargine administration. Alrighty, drop those answers in the chat. Let us know what you're thinking. Alrighty, and so you know, we have an events page at uworldnursing.com. It's a great home base for 
everything we're doing at you world nursing on social it gives you a calendar of the next three weeks of topics the times and channels that we plan to go live typically we're going to go live tuesdays at 12 p.m central standard time and then wednesday and thursday at 3 p.m central standard time so make sure you uh, check out youworldnursing.com you're also able to plug in your name and your email and a couple of quick things like your university um, and your graduation year and you'll get personalized emails to your inbox every single week that tell you what topics we plan to cover uh, the channels and the times too. So make sure you're not missing out on anything that we have going on. These are great resources, but also importantly, they are free resources. So make sure you take advantage of them. Again, that's youworldnursing.com. All right, I'm gonna check our chat and see what everyone is thinking. You guys are doing so well today so far, way to go. And our correct option here is going to be option number four. So again, this is going to be a requires follow-up. Um, so we're looking for an incorrect statement. The incorrect statement in this case would require follow-up, therefore it's our correct option. So uh, we know that insulin Lispro is a rapid acting insulin. Insulin Glargine is a long acting insulin. Um, so rapid acting, I always remember this by insulin list pro list sounds like less like less time therefore it's rapid acting and glargine large sounds like large or a large amount of time which would be a long acting insulin so that's just a little trick that helps me remember it um, but in this case option four is going to be our incorrect statement because we know that a long acting insulin is going to prevent hyperglycemia it's going to control that blood sugar for periods of like 24 hours um, it has no pronounced peak uh, so because of this um, at one hour for a long acting insulin this hasn't really set in yet um, we have a 24 hour period so we know Know that with um, at just one hour, this is not going to give us any pertinent information on where we stand with our blood sugar. Um, so we would not be checking it just one hour after giving a rapid or sorry, a long acting insulin. Um, and then options one, two, and three, these are all correct statements. Therefore, they would not require follow up. Um, option one, insulin clargine reduces your risk of developing DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. We know that long acting insulin, which is what insulin clargine is, um, helps to prevent spikes in blood sugar, which ultimately helps us control our blood sugar and prevent DKA. This is a correct statement. Option two, I will wait to administer your insulin Lispro until your meal tray arrives. Lispro, again, Lis means less time, so it's a rapid acting insulin. When it acts so rapidly, when it has a quick onset, we wanna make sure they have a meal in front of them um, so we're not taking, tanking their blood sugar. Um, we're trying to avoid hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. This is a correct statement. And lastly, three, insulin Lispro dosing depends on the number of carbohydrates you consume. Um, we tr this is a correct understanding. We aim for a consistent carbohydrate intake take, which is going to help the provider to dose Lispro appropriately. Alrighty, moving on to question number three. We're halfway there today, guys. So the nurse is reviewing new medication prescriptions uh, for a client who is receiving clopidogrel. The nurse should clarify the prescription for option one, metoprolol, option two, furosemide, option three, omeprazole, and lastly four is levothyroxine. So go ahead, drop your answers in the chat. For any of these questions that are simply just listing medications, what I always do is I go through each one and see if I know the indication for it, if I know what class of medications it's from. Um, really the best thing you can do is just piece together all the information that you have because sometimes on NCLEX questions, you are gonna get medications that you're not familiar with. So whatever information you do have, you're gonna wanna uh, call from memory um, and attach to each of the answer choices. In the meantime, let us know what topics you want us to perform, to present. Um, we get a lot of requests for these pharmacology concepts, so we're trying to meet that need with today's live. But if you want to see more OB, more PEDS, more critical care related content, drop it in the chat. Let us know. We really do take into account what you all would like to see us do. Um, so we're here to help you. Let us know how we can best do that. Um, and also, it's just so interesting and fun to see all the topics that you guys want to learn more about. Uh, mental health is also one we've been getting a lot recently, so we will definitely work that into our content calendar. All right, I'm going to go ahead and jump to our answer, and I see a lot of correct options in our chat today. Way to go, you guys. Um, but our correct option is that omeprazole. So omeprazole is a PPI, or a proton pump inhibitor, and uh, clopidogrel is an antiplatelet medication. We know that omeprazole can reduce the efficacy of clopidogrel. This is why we would clarify the prescription. Alrighty, great job on that one, you guys. 
Uh, moving on to question four, we have an OB question. So OB meds here. The nurse is reviewing new medication prescriptions for a client at 29 weeks gestation who's experiencing preterm labor. The nurse should clarify the prescription for option one is magnesium sulfate, two is betamethasone, three is endomethacin, and four is doxycycline. Alrighty guys, drop those answers in the chat. Again, these are all just the options are straight medications. So if you want to attach each one, do you know what drug class it is? Do you know what the indication is? Um, do you know what the mechanism of action is? Uh, any contraindications? Whatever information you can recall here can help you piece together the answer, especially if you don't know what all of these medications are. That is my best tip for answering pharmacology medications when all of the answer options are just medications. Um, and I also am curious, did anyone here today participate in our holiday gifting, uh, our holiday gifting extravaganza? We gave away a couple of free UWorld 30-day subscriptions. Um, so let us know in the chat, did you join? Did you participate? Maybe did you win? Do we have any of our, our winners, our lucky winners in our chat today? So let us know. Um, we love doing that. It was so much fun to give away these subscriptions. It was so much fun to interact with you guys like that. We definitely want to do it more in the future. So let us know if you participated. Let us know if you want to see us keep doing it. Alrighty. I'll give you a few more seconds. I know OB is tough for some people. And let me check the chat, see what everyone is thinking. And it looks like you guys got this one spot on per usual. I am not surprised. Way to go, you guys. Um, but doxycycline is going to be our correct answer because it's what we should clarify. So like incorrect medication means it's our correct answer. Um, so we have a client here at 29 weeks gestation. Remember in pregnancy and OB, we're trying to get to 40 weeks. So 29 weeks is very, very early and they're experiencing preterm labor. So doxycycline is a tetracycline antibiotic. It's not safe for use during pregnancy at all. Uh, the medication can through that placenta causing fetal harm. So side effects include um, a regular development of the fetal teeth and bones. So we do not want to give this uh, doxycycline. We should clarify, we should not be giving this to this pregnant client. So that would be our correct option because it's our incorrect medication. Uh, options one, two, and three. So option one is magnesium sulfate. This is safe during pregnancy. It's usually given via an IV drip. Um, it's neuroprotective and it helps to protect that fetus against cerebral palsy. Um, it is used often in preterm labor. It's indicated for preterm labor. Option two is betamethasone. This is a steroid. Now, a lot of times, you know, we're 29 weeks. We're still young. Those fetal lungs are the very last thing to develop. So if we're 29 weeks, we're a far cry from 40 weeks. We want to give those lungs as much um, chance to develop, as much of a boost as we can, and the steroid shot will do this. We typically give this in two doses, so two separate shots, ideally 24 hours apart. It's given via an IM or an intramuscular muscular injection to the maternal clients. Alrighty, and lastly, endomethacin, this is a, an NSAID. It prevents prostaglandin production, which helps to relax the smooth muscle of the uterus, hoping, uh, hopefully quelling contractions, ceasing contractions, ceasing labor. Um, this is indicated for preterm labor. So we would indeed give these ones. That's why they're not what we would clarify. Therefore, our correct option is what we would clarify, and that was option for doxycycline. Alrighty, question number five. So the nurse is caring for a client with bipolar one disorder who is uh, receiving lithium. The nurse should recognize which of the following risk factors for developing lithium toxicity. Select all that apply. So we have options, dehydration, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, hepatic cirrhosis, as well as AKI or acute kidney injury. Let us know what you think. Drop those answers in the chat. And if you haven't told us already, where are you joining from? Who is uh, here from the United States? Who's here from abroad? We have international viewers. We've had a lot of viewers from the Philippines, from Lebanon, and some from Russia as well. So thank you so much for joining. We are so happy to have you guys. Um, it's always so interesting to see uh, all the people that join us from far and wide. Uh, and we also, it's interesting to see what time is it there? Are y'all joining us super late at night? Is it super early in the morning? Um, it's always so interesting to know. So let us know. All right. I'll give you a few more seconds. This is a tough one. Um, the mental health medications, mental health pharmacology can be really challenging. A lot of these medications, um, the mental health medications have some really severe side effects too. So there's a lot to remember here. There's a lot going on here. I'll give you a little extra time because I know this is a challenging question. All right. 
I see a lot of answers coming in in the chat. Way to go, you guys. Alrighty, and I'm going to go ahead and hop to our answer answers, excuse me, one, three, and five. So lithium is a mood stabilizer. It's indicated for bipolar one disorder. It has a very narrow therapeutic index. So we need to monitor clients very frequently and very closely to make sure there isn't a toxic buildup or accumulation of the drug in the system. So essentially what we're looking for, things that potentiate uh, lithium toxicity are things that affect uh, the dilution or filtration of the body. So things that are dilutional are things like dehydration as well as hyponatremia or low serum sodium and then filtration acute kidney injury we know that the kidneys filter our blood so we have an aki or an acute kidney injury that's going to impede the kidney's ability to filter our blood so again dilutional and filtration uh, problems are going to be risk factors for developing this lithium toxicity that's why we have options one three and five is our correct options Options two and four, these are not really related. Um, hyperkalemia, now this uh, may indicate potential kidney problems, but standalone hyperkalemia on its own is not a risk factor for lithium toxicity. Alrighty, great job, you guys. And let's head to our last question. So the nurse is preparing to administer phenytoin to a client with seizure disorder, um, a seizure disorder, excuse me. The nurse should recognize that effort, adverse effects of phenytoin include option one is hypertension, two is acute kidney injury, three is uh, deep venous thrombosis, and lastly, four is central nervous system depression. Alrighty, and one last reminder, we go live three times a week, Tuesdays at noon Central Standard Time, uh, Wednesday and Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, so make sure you tune in for those. We have some great stuff planned. We're so excited for the new year. Um, keep letting us know in the comments what topics do you want to see, uh, what times do you want to see us go live at, is there a day that maybe works better for you guys? We really want to tailor this to all of our wonderful, wonderful students that are joining us, um, all of our NCLEX studiers, all of our nursing students students. Um, so however we can help you, let us know whether that's a topic you want to see us do, whether that's a day you want to see us go live, or whether it's a time that works best for you. Let us know. We are all ears. Okie doke. Let's go ahead and uh, check our chat. Let's see what you guys are thinking. And I see a lot of correct options. Great job. Uh, our correct option here, you guys got it, option four. So central nervous system depression. So phenytoin acts on the CNS or central nervous system in a relatively selective fashion to suppress seizures because we know this client has a seizure disorder, but the drugs can still cause some CNS effects, especially when the dosage is high or excessive. So um, that's why for the central nervous system depression is a adverse effects of uh, phenytoin that could potentially include options one, two, and three. So option one is hypertension. This is incorrect. We more commonly see hypertension bow tension as a potential adverse effect. Um, so that would be incorrect. Option two, AKI, acute kidney injury. This is not associated with the use of phenytoin. And lastly, DVT or a deep venous thrombosis. Uh, phenytoin actually increases our risk of bleeding, whereas DVT is a thrombolytic event, which is uh, clotting. Uh, we're not at risk for clotting, we're at risk for bleeding. So that would also be incorrect and our correct option was option four. Alrighty, so that sums up our uh, question drill for today. Thank you so, so much for joining. It's so good to see you all. We're so excited to go into 2025 with you guys. Keep letting us know how we can best serve you, the times, the topics, the days to go live. Let us know what works for you. Uh, a reminder that this live will be on demand on our social channels, especially it gets up there really quickly on our YouTube and our Facebook. So check those channels out at UWorld Nursing um, and check out our events page at uworldnursing.com uh, for a full calendar and more information on all things U World Nursing. Thank you guys so much for joining. I know that pharmacology is a challenging topic, but you guys rose to the occasion today. Uh, thank you again, and I hope to see you guys soon.